everybody welcome to episode 205 fight chat friday so we nearly had a, a clash there that's the the start of the sparring right into it we're clashing already <laughs> so uh a little bit of a hiatus so i had a, a new baby boy welcomed into the world so a little bit busy with that and congratulations and thanks very much and adrian you had a bit of news yourself as well you were uh, working with something I was under the knife, first of all. I'd, uh, yeah, yeah, so I'd, I'd, uh, I'd some hip issues for the last number of months, and I finally got got to the surgeon, and uh, we had some arthroscopy and some uh, some bone shaved down and uh, a labrum repair. So I've been uh, uh, not moving very well for the last uh, three weeks or so. And uh, so when you put those two things together, we life kind of got in the way in a big way. Uh, so yeah, it's been difficult enough to stay on our consistent schedule for the last little while, but hopefully, hopefully we're back. Yeah. So today we're going to have a little chat based on the last episode 204. If you haven't caught onto that one yet, we were a little bit involved there with the whole idea of constraints and sparring yeah. and what it all means. And where we kind of left that episode off was talking about how important tasks are for ITF sparring and where we can spend a lot of our time in training and where we should spend a lot of our time training to focus on particular areas to develop and become skillful so like yeah that's the first thing we got to talk about like what is being skillful as it relates to itf sparring from your point of view adrian yeah and i suppose just to couch this this is um we're looking for really kind of specific actionable tasks i suppose at this stage things mm -hmm. you can plug into your training sessions rather than like broader concepts i suppose so this is what does it look like to get people training and what does that training look like right away when that is the fundamental bit that you're going to do and i suppose the goal of any one of the tasks is that both of the people within the activity have a, like a training outcome a goal it should be somewhat representative of the spar now that doesn't mean it should be exactly like the full game but it does mean that, you know, there is some subset of the rules applied, something relating to the, you know, the space, the distance. And most importantly, your opponent is trying to stop you or trying to make it diff more difficult for you to do what it is that you're trying to do and vice versa. So that we end up straight away in uh, a simplified, not necessarily simple, but a simplified version of the game where the skill or tactic or strategy that we're trying to work on is getting an opportunity to develop with real opposition. Yeah, and that's what it is because that's the game we're practicing for and preparing for. It's the competitive side of ITF sparring more than anything else, which relates to getting more scores on the board over mm. your opponent while also following the rules of the competitive game of sparring, which involves not leaving the ring, not falling over because these things obviously hamper your score. So obviously, like it's quite unique because a lot of the time now the high level game is not something that we can practice because we don't have those perfect set rings with four referees in each corner and a center ref as well to control the action with live scoring so it's not something that we actively get to practice as often as we'd like so that's where our tournaments are very important um so that means we have to try and make training as representative as we can but i suppose yeah. the very simply the aim of the game as we said in the last episode is to hit and not get hit so what yeah. are the tasks that we can give our athletes or students or group, whatever you want to call it, to be able to get in these situations as often as possible where they can learn, try to adapt, try to pick up some new skills, try to self-organize? Because we can now, now know from research that everything that you do is context specific and it is very specific as well to what you can see from your point of view that's not always yeah. what you take in like actually take in sometimes it's subconscious and it's something that you don't even realize you're doing but that's how we act in sport and that's how we become skillful it's we self-organize based on a problem so what does that mean for us i guess it means we have to give our athletes and students the correct problems for them to be in there often to be able to solve different things and different tasks and have objectives which are related to the high level of the game if we're going to reverse engineer to be able to get people to that higher level to be to build champions or to build high level skillful itf sparring athletes so if we kind of take that to the, the very first principle, we have that idea of hit and don't get hit. So one of the first things that we're going to be looking to do is to find a way to get our athletes into the right distance so that their attacking techniques are effective. And then we want the other person disruptive of that. We don't want to uh, uh, let the person freely move as if they're kicking a punch bag, a stationary target or a predictably moving target. We want that target or that opponent 
to have some opposing principles. We want them to be interrupting, changing distance, changing direction, um, and perhaps interfering with what it is we're trying to do, whether that is kick or punch. Yeah, and I guess that's that's it because like the over the overarching principles of how we want training to look like has a few facets in it in itself. The first thing is we don't want too much cooperation from both sides. So it needs to yeah. be unplanned, unscripted, uncooperative, because it's very, very easy for me to do anything if you're not stopping me from doing it and there's no resistance. Sure. Um, and there's levels to this. We can scale it correctly. We can progress whatever you want. But like, also, we want multiple solutions to develop. So that's another issue as well, because we spoke about in the last episode, who knows if we have the game of ITF span cracked, and we probably don't. Like every single sport, whether it's basketball, they're getting more developed with the skills. It, it can be any sport you want in the world. Like the more we see that sport and the more we get more expertise, more experience, people are becoming more skillful and more efficient within that rule set. And it's going to be the same for us. So there's techniques that maybe we haven't even discovered yet or there's tactics we haven't even discovered yet. The game is always developing. So we want multiple solutions. We don't want to really be telling people this is the way you have to do it. And we use the example of the twisting kick in the last episode. Yeah. The, the tasks should be non technique specific ideally no sometimes we will be working on particular shots we want to bring into the game and maybe this is useful in this situation but there should be also other things that are useful um so we want multiple solutions ideally we want frequent exposure then as well so we want to be exposed to the tasks and the environments where we want to be very proficient in often simple one of uh, uh, that comes off the top of my head is we can simply train in ring spaces or squares or whatever that we can understand the space we got to stay in yeah. maybe another factor is we want to really focus on every time we get the hands being able to finish with that extra bonus point of a kick that can be a feature of a task an objective we don't have to tell them what kick it is we don't have to tell them what entry we don't have to tell them the exact way you got to do it or we don't have to drill two punches into turning kick, two punches into turning kick, repeat, repeat, repeat. For sure. We can put tasks and create scenarios creatively to be able to come up with solutions for this based on the game. And I think if you have a game that is crafted correctly, you can encourage that to happen. And that's the ideal goal we're looking for. So going back to even just that initial idea of, okay, let's say we want to have someone make that appropriate distance to make contact. We could limit that in the beginning and say, well, look, we just want you to use your front leg and score to the hip. And that could be side kick, could be turning kick. It could even be if the facing is right, it could be a hook kick that the person's going to try, but they could try to do like a rear leg front push kick. There's like, you could get have that front leg twisting kick. You could get weird things emerging that we don't expect. Like when you say front leg, we're expecting it'll be side kick and maybe it'll be someone trying to do a side kick and it looks like a turning kick. Um, yeah. But, you know, we could get, uh, we, we can get a little bit of, you know, exposure to different options from that. But then flip it around to the other side. Well, what's the other person doing in this situation? Yeah. Well, they need the opposite side of it. And I always use the example of in our um national sport here in ireland it's ga so we always played hurling and football in school growing up but it's, soccer is another good example where you have a game of backs and forwards um and maybe you're always a back but then playing the game of back and forwards and switching you get the experience being an attacker for a while and you kind of yeah. pick up tricks because of experience and maybe the things that people have done against you so getting to experience both sides of the coin is very important and for us if we turn that into a itf sparring example it could be legs versus hands. So you're trying to use your legs in any way to score. I'm trying to use my hands. And that can simulate you being able to deal with someone who's a very aggressive puncher and looking to close the distance a lot and use your legs to be able to keep them back. And then obviously you get to experience the flip side of the coin as well, which is very, very important because maybe it's not going to be your game and your bread and butter, but to understand what makes people successful at that particular thing is vital for your understanding to be able to be effective if you meet that. So in this case, as you said, you might find that the person, oh, they like to back off of that initial kicking attack. And that kind of creates situations where the, well, the person who was kicking, now maybe they don't commit as much to that front leg. Maybe they mm -hmm. keep a bit of a utility or they, they hold the chamber a little lighter. They kick from a shorter stance or they look to recover a little quicker so that they can springboard off of it. Um, maybe the person starts to get evasive and they get very lateral. So they turn left or right and they start to move this way. So then it becomes, can you create the movement to, set up okay so my next movement needs to track and go over here 
uh, if they get hands on. So if they start to interfere with the leg with hands, well, that kind of creates that thing of like, oh, well, then can you mess up the speed or the like the the pausing of the technique so that they miss with the hand and you get to connect through over or you go, uh, you faint and go through the hand or whatever it happens to be. Likewise, then, you know, if, if they've been allowed to kick uh, and we bring that kind of thing into it, um, it then means they have to expose themselves to a certain risk as well. If they're, if they're countering with hands, they have to get around the leg, they have to deal with it differently and they expose themselves a little bit. And now you get that interplay between two people and we start to build an understanding of the basics of the game. So I suppose yeah. in terms of finishing with our principles, that's the first principle of even if we only play with a very limited set of rules or limited mm -hmm. set of techniques, it should still have the feeling of the game. Yeah, exactly. That's it. And so what we want to do is strip it all back and see what are the things that we need to be successful at to play the game. And then ideally, we're trying to craft many objectives, tasks or games to be able to be exposed to this often. And that all goes with the whole idea of blocked practice and as well and, and randomize that you can get that recall and be able to do it a couple of weeks with different things, but still working on a, a particular skill that's shown to be quite helpful. So what are we talking about here? Examples that we can use for our game would be very simply, first principle is close in the distance to make contact. So if we can craft many um, objectives or tasks or games to be able to do this, and again, like you said earlier, it's the flip side as well because the other side might be trying to stop you from doing that. So one thing that um, I've been working on re recently is just a very simple exercise called the bullet game where one side has three bullets and your bullets is any shot thrown. Okay, and within 30, okay. 40 seconds, you have to pick the right moment, the right opportunity to be able to use that counter attack effectively. Yeah. Well, the other person then, because there's not as much volume coming back on the opposite side, they're going to be able to increase their volume and opportunities and maybe be able to look for opportunities to close that distance to put you under pressure. That's one way. Not only are you working yeah. on what we're looking at here, but you're also working on tempo you're looking at being able to put pressure build momentum so there's other things that will come in and you're never just really working on one area so that's the beauty of um, training in this way as well um, another thing is staying in range without leaving the area so that's very important for us we want to be able to stay within the area not put ourselves to the corners or the edges and make ourselves vulnerable because we know that the visual of getting points is more clear when you're in the center of the ring and it's easy for all judges Absolutely. to easily see it and if you step out of that area, of course, you're going to be giving up conceding um, ring position as well, which is not ideal. Dealing with the front leg is a very, very important one for our game. And that's particularly the sidekick because it's probably the most common thing thrown. And we've seen this in the stats. Yeah. Most fights have over 40 in any match of the front leg carries. And this is or, a utility yeah, shamer usually. It's the one or the other. It's, a, it's, it's the, the flicky front leg turning kick or it's the pump side kick that, you know, is, is the carry there. But yeah, wh whether you look at it one or the other, that front leg is essential. We have to be able to deal with that. Yeah, and then next we have finishing with a kick after hand. So anytime you get the hands, can you get that bonus score? Now, a higher level of this is called re-engagements, which we've covered on the channel before, is maybe you can get the hands, create a nice angle, and then re-engage with hands again. That's a, another idea of what we're trying to do, maximize scores. After that, we've got an idea of first in, last out. So that's engagement control. Can you be first into contact and then be the last one out of that contact as well, getting that last exclamation score an example of this is we did a couple of uh, rounds recently mm. on reverse points barring or backwards points barring so the last person to get the the last score on the board wins as opposed to getting the first score um another area that we want to be very competent in is escaping the corners or edges so that kind of goes back to number two we mentioned earlier but maybe this is more related to uh, making a decision before your last mat so if you get yeah. to the edge too much it's going to be a bad time there for you. You don't want to be making a decision then. So number one, recognizing the opportunities when you got to make that call and then be comfortable to be able to get out of it in a tight space as well and not get hit on the way, obviously, because a lot of the time we have people that might escape the corner but get kicked in the head on the way, which is not ideal. And, and then, not productive. No, definitely not. And then finally, um, just to give you some idea of one of the main things we will be looking at as tasks will be to score and defend in the last 30 seconds or go and attack and get the win because this is highly specific to the game and the competition of sparring so we see a lot of fights at high level will come down to that last 30 40 seconds there'll be warnings at play which make or break the fight and usually there's someone winning or losing and they gotta up it 
or be able to control it, move around, evade, avoid. And like, again, this kind of relates to many things we said here. If you're trying to score and get a win in the last 30 seconds because you're losing, that means you got to be able to close the distance, which was the first thing. Maybe you got to push people towards the corners. Maybe you got to build momentum. Maybe you got to be first and last out. So you can see how all these things connect. So here are seven things, Adrian, for people to just be able to base the, let's call it the 80-20 the of ITF sparring. If you can nail these things, you have a good chunk of the game. If you can be successful at these, you'll be able to do quite well generally. And I think one of the little bit of bits of hidden advice and all of that is um, those things don't depend too much on what your favorite techniques are, are yeah. whether or not you can throw a reverse turning kick or a north side downward kick, um, you know, whether or not you've got a blitz, whether you're taller or smaller. They all relate to kind of underlying principles of can you be first or on top? Can you be uh, can you score in the right areas in the ring? Can you avoid traveling, exiting or uh, giving up warnings? When you do get into contact, can you finish with an exclamation mark score? Um, you know, if you're first in, can you also be last out and kind of get top and tail the scoring exchange? All of these things are agnostic of your height, your weight class, your speed, your own personal preferences of shot selection. So you can use this for your whole class and it'll work from like white yellow belt beginners through to very experienced black belt competitors. The intensity changes, but the, the subject matter doesn't. Yeah. Um, so maybe let's give some people some ideas of what we can constrain or manipulate yeah. to be able to get different results. So one thing we can use is constrain what you can use in terms of weapon choice or technique choice or you can just use your hands. You can just use your legs. You can just use the bottom of your foot. You can only use spinning techniques, whatever. I know we're talking about not using particular techniques, but at least it lets us talk about what you can do in terms of an over general kind of a team. I know it's not very specific techniques. That's one thing. Another thing mm -hmm. that we like to do, myself and Adrian in particular, are rolling starts. So in yeah. the last competition that we were at recently, I noticed that some of us needed to work on being able to hit while moving back in case of somebody rushes in really quick and they get past that first stopping shot. Maybe we have a defensive psychic, but it's just not quite there. And then what do we do as a result? So when we're getting put under pressure on the back foot, how can we deal with that? So rolling starts is a good way to train that. So that's like it says on the tin, it's a rolling start. So example, yeah. somebody attacks into a blitz and we allow them to come onto it. It can even be onto the chest just because obviously we don't want to be taking free punches on the head it's not ideal so let's get you to initiate onto me adrian with a blitz of two plus punches onto my chest and then the round will only start or the exchange will only start once that has complete another one that adrian uses a lot is the defensive psychic so that's being able to yep. have the gloves covered up somebody rushes in and they use a defensive psychic and then once they get past that range the exchange begins so that's an example. So we have rolling starts. We have been able to manipulate what you can and can't use. Another way we can um, constrain things as well is being able to use timing. So maybe you have to do Countdowns. something within X amount of seconds. You have countdowns, a little bit of pressure, a little bit more on uh, your back there. And we can do that in groups as well to encourage a little yeah. bit more pressure, which is similar to competition fields. Any other ideas on even just those ones, of, you know, those last 20 seconds and so on just in terms of the time it's very important as well to understand that we can contain the space sparring doesn't happen have to happen in a square but in most clubs sparring happens with everybody if like if you're lucky enough to have a big hole it often means that everybody's on the floor all at once to make the best use of the time but then they're not sparring within a particular frame so they're not used to watching how close to the edge they are they're not used to cornering a person or putting a person into uh, a situation where they're uh, they're having to avoid traveling to concede the warning and and the dynamics mm. that come out of that then we've also got the uh, the idea of the game state and we very often have like i would say uh, that most of the time when we when people do sparring exercises it's as if the game is 50 50 it just started everyone's in the middle of the ring and the scores are zero zero no warnings no fouls and that lasts for like 30 seconds at most, most of the time, there is someone who's winning, someone who's losing. You have warnings or you're trying to push the person for their third warning. 
you might have a foul or even two fouls. You might have to be cautious of the techniques that you're using so you don't get disqualified. So having a changing game state that you have to react to and keep track of, because one of the things that's really difficult as well is keeping track of all of that information in your head because mm. you're trying to remember the game state rather than because you can't stare at the scoreboard. Um, as well as getting information in from your coach, as well as the perceptual information from the, the ring and your opponent. So the cognitive load of that and the concentration required for that is something that takes practicing as well. How do we do it? Have somebody in the lead, have someone on the outside reverse it, or have a situation where you start on two warnings and the other for, for your point sparring. So an exit or a score against you gives the other person a point. Um, look at things where you so you know you're a number of points ahead or behind with time remaining and then the game state can change and it could even be a case of let's say you have 30 seconds remaining you're two points ahead if the other person gets two single scores or a head score you're now behind and you have to go and chase so you can have the the situation flipping and reversing and practice that and everything that you practice that's dynamic and representative of what happens in a match it means you're less likely to feel the situation is unfamiliar uncomfortable or you know uh, that you have a decision paralysis because we always want to be thinking about what's important now as in what should i be doing in this moment and making good correct decisions under pressure and that's one of the beautiful benefits of this type of training it's it includes always adaptability because you always have to adapt so ideally the the theory behind it is we're ideally making better decision makers because of this type of training as opposed to being told what to do or being prescribed a sequence of movements to do against this sequence of movements you got to figure out the problem yourself and be able to adapt and there's many ways to be able to do that if one doesn't work maybe you have to do something else and um, so ideally you become like as we know because of the scoreboards etc you need to be quite an adaptable fighter you have to change quickly and rapidly in very short rounds to be able to maybe you're behind maybe you're ahead maybe you gotta do this that whatever it may be based on the, the, the game state so that's one important thing but i think a nice way to wrap up maybe today would be if we took yeah. one example of an objective that we would want to cover over a, a while and maybe we could go back and forth, Adrian, and give some examples on how we could um, have constraints to be able to put that right. out there. Well, to let how about go. let's take the idea of building momentum or adding value to your exchanges? Lovely. Okay, I'll start off. So one that we've been working cool. on recently is just a very basic one. It's called levels. And we do this in many different ways. Um, the, the, the game is levels, but we can change the rules to make it suit whatever we want to do. So this is one we did last last night. It's levels, and level one is you're looking for an entry score. So you get an entry score, you say, okay, I score, that's level one complete for me. Level two is I get an entry score plus an add-on. Example is I get the hands, I finish with a turning kick. Or I get a head kick with a hacks, and then right away I'm on top of them with a blitz. So that's your entry plus your add-on. And then finally, level three would be entry plus add-on plus add-on. Okay, and then that yeah. develops a little bit of momentum. So you're getting the combinations a little bit better and it encourages people. Um, so both people are trying to objectively um, complete this mission by getting com uh, past level three first. If you do that, you win. Um, and what it does as well is like it's free sparring. You can use all your shots to get the objective done, but it allows you to kind of build on the techniques and maybe say you have a really good sidekick. It's like, oh yeah, I got that in. That was good. Maybe I can build on that and I'll get an extra point from there. So it just stops the like, Point sparring is great because it teaches people the value of scores and how to be clear, clean, and precise. But then we often lose that um, ability to be able to double up and gain momentum. But that's one example. Sorry, I got you at the wrong time. Yeah, they, they managed to start drilling outside here. So to, to take that same example, let's just talk about ways that once you've done it a few times, there's a bit of familiarity, we can level it up or we can gamify it more to give people some extra challenges. Also to deal with groups that are of mixed ability. So you could have where if a person gets to a particular level, they can unlock a bonus round or a bonus thing where, let's say, for example, it could be that, OK, we want to see if we can have our, uh, our engagement, our follow on, and can we force a warning or our engagement, our follow on, and can we have a clean exit shot? Our engagement, our follow on, a clean exit shot and a re-engagement or a, uh, uh, our, our entry. Uh, our follow on and a re engagement. So, something like that. So, those could be bonus levels or bonus rounds that you might award. Um, 
you have then you could also have, Adrian? Yeah, absolutely. So in this case, we're looking at the idea of um, getting people to really sense when momentum is with them or against them. So juice works like the idea of tennis. So all you have is you have to have two consecutive scores. Every score is worth one point. And you start level with your opponent as if the game is dead level. And you have to score twice consecutively in order to get ahead. And what that forces or encourages people to do is to say, oh, you have advantage. You're ahead of me right now. I have to fix that before you get momentum by getting two scores ahead. Because now the game is kind of slipping out of reach for me. So I should do whatever's important next to make sure that I minimize that score and pull the other person back. And we can even modify that by starting a person on two warnings. So we can use the warning situation to disadvantage. Let's say you have a, a slightly better competitor against a slightly weaker opponent. Well, you could start the stronger one on two warnings so that, okay, it might initially go just by who scored the point, but at some point in time, forcing that person to exit takes away their advantage or means that you gain advantage. So, you know, there's little things that we can do like that to tweak the, uh, the game state. Yeah, another one is any two of three. So yeah. me and Adrian are sparring, and let's say we pick three techniques. Let's say blitz, axe kick, bande, and one second. And then from there, um, you got to score any two of those three in any order. Okay, so yeah. we play around with this. Maybe I initiate with that turning kick, and then I try a bande right after because they kind of link up well together. I miss. So I only got one, but then I'll try again. Maybe I'll adapt it a little bit. Maybe I'll start with a band -Aid. Probably won't land that straight off the bat, but it allows you to develop and try to work with techniques and flow. Um, so there's three examples already that we've used to be able to build momentum. Um, yeah, I mean, you can also points? do things like force follows. So, you know, the idea that, I mean, a big enemy of building momentum is people throwing single shots that don't, that, that are just kind of thrown out there. They don't have the intent to follow. And you've already highlighted some good examples that kind of encourage people to go and follow on. But you can work the other way as well. And you can penalize a person for not following. So, you know, if they, let's say, for example, the most common one, we give them a, a you can spar, a free spar, but if you throw a sidekick, and you don't immediately go to hands afterwards or you don't immediately add hands or a turning kick uh, then there's a penalty and it could be something to amuse the other person like they have to do uh, three laps of the ring or five burpees or they have to you know wow. do a, a tumble or sing a song or yeah absolutely whatever it is you're trying to get people to think about why did i throw that kick what was it for and yeah. if you had thrown the kick with better intention you know, or in better timing it would have been easier to follow and one of the good things about that as well is it allows the other side to be able to read the gap between the shots. Like if I lead off with a sidekick and try and get directly to blitz, there's a yeah. gap there between those two shots where people can take advantage and start their own sidekick. Um, so there's nice advanced methods of our game that we can kind of sneak in there as well to be able to teach people things. Definitely. So, oh, yeah. I mean, I think those are four kind of rudimentary examples that can grow they can they can be expanded to the nth degree but they get people started in terms of understanding richie has a role i have a role our roles are complementary uh one is given you know something of a solution to the problem that i'm presenting and vice versa so we have interplay of techniques that really do react together in sparring and we both are incentivized to try to win so the one thing that's remaining to say is as a coach you are still trying to design the environment to achieve a particular outcome. And in this case, let's say the focus is on getting me to be able to uh, to build that score. So it's about me connecting techniques together to uh, get to that high value score. So if that's the case, I would like to be successful 55% of the time. You know, so we would like to maybe disadvantage the other person very slightly or within the matchup, make sure that I have a very slight, uh, slightly improved opportunity for success. And that is, you know, that can then be tweaked the whole time. Once it's successful, like 60, 70% of the time, the game's unbalanced. It's not working anymore. It's not actually opposed. So we want it to be just north of 50% success rate for the working individual, but there should be a return. There should be a, a sense of achievement for the other person then as well. Yeah, absolutely. So some good ideas there. So hopefully you took something away from this. If you want to try them, see how they work for you. Uh, maybe if you've got some ideas or some topics that you'd like us to cover 
on this. Maybe it's a way of training a, a particular technique. Maybe it's a strategy. How would you train X? Who knows? So let us know where you'd like us to go from this and the questions that are naturally jumping to mind from listening to these last two episodes. And uh, hopefully we can help some people and craft some ideas and go from there. It'll be good. Well, we're back. So hopefully we'll see everybody next Friday and we can get back to our consistent streak again. We lost our streak, Richie. You know, (laughs) it's desperate. All right, we'll build one up again. We have over 200 episodes. so We've been doing a bit of work. We have, we have. All right, well, best luck, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. See you then.